Welcome back to World War Two TV, especially the hardcore who watched the two and a half hour show with Doug Nash earlier on. Uh, what a performance that was. But anyway, we are off the ETO now. William Nance is back. He talked about cavalry groups last time. This time he's still about General Simpson and the Ninth Army. His new book is uh, linked in the description below where you'll find all the links you need. Merchandise links, how to support World War Two TV, Patreon membership, all that kind of stuff. I'll bring William in now. Good afternoon, sir. How are you today? Uh, Paul, doing great. A little snowy outside. Uh, we, we've got snowy about here. four or five inches. Uh, yeah, I, I saw your pictures from earlier today. It looks beautiful out there. It was nice. A bit chilly and a bit slippery. I'm at the age now where I kind of walk with a bit of hesitation when it gets snowy now. I, I, I envy being when I was 15. I just run out, run through it. All. But anyway, I've Ninth got two Army. teenage boys. They shovel. Yeah, they do. Ninth Army. If there's one unit that is overlooked in the ETO, it's Ninth Army. And if there's you know, a commanding officer who's overlooked, who never comes up, when people talk about great commanders, his name never comes up. So before we start talking about the actual presentation, um, why has it taken so long for someone like yourself to bring his his name to back to the forefront again? A lot of what it just came out to is Simpson is one of those guys that just did the job. And as such, when people asked him about it, he's he was like, I just did my job. You need to go talk to other people. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll bring up this book. Uh, it's kind of backwards, I guess, but it's Conquer. That's the uh, official history of the U.S. Ninth Army. And up until about criminy, uh, the Conquering Ninth, when this book came out by Nathan Prefer, that was the last word on the Ninth Army. And what it was is that, you know, it, it sort of sold books, but uh, really what sells books is the Third Army. Mm. And don't get me wrong. I, I love me uh, some General Patton and uh, Kevin Heimel and John Nelson Record. They do a great job with those. They, I mean, uh, uh, they, got, uh, they got places of honor over there on the bookshelf. But Third Army sells books and Ninth Army just was a kind of a steady, reliable, getting the job done. If you think of it like group work, you've got kind of the flashy person who's always putting his hand up and talking and all that kind of stuff. And then you got the guy that you, you send out for pizza. We can call that guy Hodges. Uh, and then there's the guy that actually, you know, sits down and does the work. And that's Simpson. And what I've discovered kind of doing in my research is that Simpson was probably not as unusual as we think of in the U.S. Army. It's just it's unusual in the literature, if that makes sense. Right. We have a lot more people like him who just do the job. Sandy Patch, uh, Seventh Army, is another great example. That's another guy we don't really talk about because they get overshadowed by these big personalities. Um, in your own army, uh, I mean, people talk about Montgomery, but how many of uh, people really talk about Dempsey or Horrocks or um, yeah. uh, Carrera? Uh, I'm screwing up the names probably, but Carrera. I mean, you, you talk about those guys a heck of a lot more. Well, it's, we, you know, we, we're going down a massive rabbit hole already, but that you know, the personalities push history. People come to history because of the Pattons and the MacArthur's and the Montgomery's and the Adolf Gallans and all those other names there, and and that's just the world we live in. But uh, anyway, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna carry on. Um, you're in charge. You're in charge of telling me when to nudge on the slides, folks. Fire away with questions, and Bill will answer them. Hopefully, we go along. But we're gonna learn about the Ninth Army. So over to you, Bill. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing is like, why this guy? Uh, because it, you, you kind of brought up the question of, well, why Simpson? And it actually started from my last book. I was looking at Sabres Through the Reich. And part of the research for that was I kind of had to build the operational narrative. And Third Army was very, very easy. Just, the secondary literature just, it sprang off the, the, off the sheets and off you go. Then I hit the Ninth Army and I'm having to go back to, in, in some cases, original archival search just to tell me what happened and i'm going well, what why is that and then i kind of dug into that and there's this great uh, there's this great quote by uh, omar bradley uh and commander of the 12th army group and i'm gonna mess it up a little bit but not that bad he says unlike the noisy and bumptious third or the temperamental first the ninth army remained uncommonly normal and that's an interesting thing because if you've served in combat or if you've been around uh all this stuff being normal is pretty hard to do and mm -hmm. so i was like wow that that's kind of cool uh i'm so i was like how how did this guy happen and then so i kind of dug into it and what i discovered was is it was simpson and his chief of staff james moore really kind of put it together uh and made the team work and a guy by the name of uh tom stone uh was a 
Army Major in the early 1970s was one of the last people to interview Simpson personally. And he had all of these records and all of the, he got Simpson's like OERs, officer evaluation reports, and all these things. And he was, he's the guy that if you want to research Simpson, you had to go to. So I called Tom up and he was like, if you want to do, if you want to talk about the Ninth Army, you got to throw in uh, James Moore too. You got to write a story about the commander and the chief of staff. I'm like, great. So there we go. So that's how we got started. So who is the guy? Uh, he's a North Texan. Uh, which, so I'm, I claim Texas as home. I was born on federal property surrounded by California. And that's my story. Uh, Mather Air Force Base, which doesn't exist anymore. And uh, grew up in North Texas. Family's pretty well-to-do, pretty reasonable, good, uh, doing well. Gets into West Point, West Point class in 1909. Interesting fun fact, Patton is his classmate. Uh, Patton was originally class of West Point 1908 but he failed math and had to repeat plebe year. Um, JCH Lee was a classmate of uh, Simpson. For those who may not know JCH Lee, he was the commander of the communication zone, which are all the logistics guys behind the field armies in Northwest Europe. Uh, basically, it, depending on who you asked, either a field army or an army group level commander. Uh, was the deputy theater commander for a while. Uh, Jake Devers was a classmate, uh, sixth army group commander. Courtney Hodges would have been a classmate, except for the fact that he also failed math and was kicked out of the academy. Simpson almost failed math. There was something about this math teacher, I swear. Like three field army commanders in Northwest Europe all struggled in this guy's class, and the academy wasn't that big. There was probably like a handful of guys teaching math to the, to the, what, to the class of 1909. I'm like, what, what's up with this guy? Um, there's probably a story there. So... Uh, as you see, graduated 101 out of 103. Not a smart, you know, not, this guy's not a genius when it comes to academics, but he knew how to ask for help. And I think that that's one of the key things that we start with Simpson is that he's not one of those guys that thinks he's the smartest man in the room. He's not one of those guys that wants to push through and just, it's my way or the highway. And uh, Jake Devers put, Simpson struggled with academics, but he knew how to uh, apply help when it was received. Mm. Was offered, uh, so somebody would give would help him out, and he knew how to do something with that. And that's kind of you, kind of a useful skill, right? You don't have to be the smart guy in the room; you just have to know how to deal with it. Yeah. So, see a couple other things there. Went to uh, went to the Philippines. Um, one thing I'll highlight in the Philippines there is that he. Worked with uh, the Philippine Scouts, which are Filipino soldiers, officered by American officers. And uh, so he fought uh, against the Moros uh, down, in, uh, down in Mindanao. Uh, that is the predecessor to many of the problems that our Filipino friends are still encountering down in that island. And then he went and did a survey mission in Luzon. And it was about half American, half Filipino. The Americans were the engineers doing the survey and the uh, Filipinos were the security element there. And he did really, really well. And you see from an early stage, the fact that he can work with other nationalities and get things done. This is of course a big gripe with uh, much of the rest of the world. Americans kind of like to push, away, push their way around and my way or the highway. Simpson doesn't seem to do that. Our, our, we don't have a lot of evidence from that time frame, but what we do have seems to suggest that he got along well. He got he got his job done efficiently, no big highlights. So he obviously had something there. Um, unit of expedition. I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is all early stuff. Um, and was uh, eventually picked to be the aide for the commander of the 33rd Division when World War One kicked off, and he wanted to go command a battalion. Uh, he'd been a lieutenant in uh, 1916. 1917, he's finally promoted to captain. Later, 1917, he's promoted to major, and he wants to go command an active duty battalion. This is a, na or a battalion. And then, because this was a National Guard division, the division commander's like, look, dude, you're an active duty officer. There's some politics going on. I can't put you in command of one of these battalions. What I can do is make you a commander of my recruit training. So Simpson's sitting going, okay, well, not great, but I'll take it. And then he 
gets sent off to a staff school in France because if there's one thing the U.S. Army kind of sucks at is large formations because the last time we did this was the turn of the century and it wasn't great. Um, and then he ends up being the G2. Turns out he right, which is intelligence. Turns out he can write an order better than the current G3 operations officer. So he is swapped out and is a G3 during the latter half. So the uh, latter half of the Moose are gone offensive. And then ends the war as a lieutenant colonel in the Army of the United States and chief of staff. So if we're doing the math. In 1909, he is a brand new butter bar second lieutenant. And in 1919 or 1918, excuse me, he's a lieutenant colonel division chief of staff. Good work when you can get it. Now, notice what I said in the Army of the United States. So we had a, kind of a, you have the regular Army ranks. And then when we needed to expand the Army rapidly, you just got kind of a, hey, have a nice rank. And then when you, and then you reverted back to your permanent rank. So after World War I, he reverts back to cap. Uh, so in June, at the end of June, he is goes from lieutenant colonel to captain. And then the next day is promoted to major <laughs> because this is how the army does, uh, does admin. It has to be done by the book. And the highlight of all of this kind of the early stage of his career is, is that he's always this guy that goes back to buy the book. Let's break open the manual. Let's do it that way. Uh, he goes to the infantry school. Uh, he goes to the command general staff school and he sits and goes, hey, somebody's kind of thought about this at a time. He, uh, I talked about that staff school he does in France. And he realizes that you don't have to ha come up with the best way to do things. You just have to come up with the OK way to do things and to be able to do the OK way every single time. Not the best way once, the OK way all the time. And that's hard to pull off. So spends the uh, interwar era doing any number of things, command and staff and teaching. And then right before World War II kicks off for the Americans, uh, the, uh, everyone else has been fighting for quite some time. Uh, he is sent over to the 2nd uh, Infantry Division. Doesn't really ever command a regiment. He shows up thinking he's going to command a regiment and then is promoted to the assistant division commander. And at that point, he gets his aide, Jim Moore. And their job is to get the 2nd Division ready to fight. And they go off and they do that, all this kind of thing. And again, it's standard procedures. This is I mean, this is probably why nobody's written a lot of books on them. Their job is to make sure people are doing things the right way. And they do it so well that Jim Moore gets pulled up to the Pentagon. Well, we don't have the Pentagon yet. We're building the Pentagon. But he gets pulled up to the War Department. And Simpson gets uh, sent out to command a recruit training detachment. And he thinks, what, and what is going on here? What had happened is the U.S. Army had built, used to send recruits straight from basically indoctrination, welcome to the Army, and send them straight to the units. During World War II, we couldn't do that because it was slowing down our production of units. So we created what we now know as one station unit training. And then uh, it was different main occupational specialty or MOS. And so he commanded infantrymen because that's kind of what he'd been doing for the past several years. Uh, so he got a recruit training uh, training training post set up in Texas. And what's interesting is that we still had that place. My wife had uh, my wife who when she was in the Texas Army National Guard actually had driven through that base a couple times. But he's doing that and then at this point he's called up to command the 35th Infantry Division. And what that was is that he had had experience with the National Guard, 33rd Division previous. Mm -hmm. And General Truman, cousin of the more famous Truman, had been relieved by Marshall for basically inability to get the division ready for combat. There had been the Louisiana maneuvers, and the 35th Division was not performing to standard. So Simpson, who had experience with the National Guard, kind of understood how the National Guard operated, was pulled over. For those that aren't American in your audience, uh, the key to understand is, is that our National Guard is kind of like our territorials. Uh, maybe a better, uh, or, or, um, the yeomanry, uh, might be a better example there. Um, and it's, they're regionally focused and they tend to stay in the same unit for a very, very long period of time. Now this builds up a lot of good unit cohesion, a lot of good, uh, ability to work together. 
but they're not funded or resourced to be active duty. They're part-time soldiers. The joke is one weekend a month, two weeks in the summer. Uh, any National Guardsman who's listening to this is probably laughing right now because we work them a lot harder than that, uh, particularly now. And when war kicked off, there's this power struggle between the National Guard guys that have been in the army for quite uh, that have been in their units for quite some time and the regular army. The National Guard viewed the regular army as a bunch of basically not very competent glory hogs who are pushing them out of the way. And the regular army looked at the National Guard as a bunch of incompetent buffoons who were too old to do things. So Simpson's kind of in the middle of this, mm -hmm. this command mm -hmm. that he's got going on right then. And what he does is the first one of the very first things he does is he fires the division chief of staff because he's like, dude, you're not a Leavenworth graduate, but I will take care of you. And he sends him off, uh, gives him a glowing letter recommendation, sends him off to go get the proper schooling. But he's like, you haven't had a Leavenworth education. You can't be my chief of staff. And then he gets Jim Moore along. Uh, who He pulls him from the Pentagon. Interesting thing about Moore, Moore had started out as a captain, then got promoted to major, lieutenant colonel. And he's getting pulled to be a division chief of staff. Marshall then said, congratulations, you're now a colonel, full colonel, 06. And... The question is, well, why? I just barely pinned on Lieutenant Colonel. He's like, you're going to go be a chief of staff for a National Guard division. If you show up as a, as a brand new Lieutenant Colonel, the other Lieutenant Colonels, National Guard Lieutenant Colonels who have been on the staff for a really long time will just n ignore you because they have date of rank on you. But if you show up as a full Colonel, they might be have been in the Army longer, but it doesn't matter because you're a full Colonel and they're a Lieutenant Colonel. So Good work when you can get it, I guess. So they take the 35th Division. They uh, go off and do great things. Uh, they uh, After Pearl Harbor, they uh, they stand up in California and help defend the coast against the non-existent Japanese invasion. Didn't know that at the time, but hey. And then at this point, Simpson's supposed to go take command of the 12th Corps as it's standing up. But this is when the next when the, the 30th Infantry Division commander is also relieved. And this is a really, really bad situation because it wasn't just like he's relieved. He then makes a stink of this, writes his senators. And remember, these are regional headquarters. These are regional units. So in the United States, a senator is kind of a big deal. There's only 100 of them. And they, of course, control the purse strings. So when uh, all of a sudden you have a bunch of senators complaining to the uh, Secretary of War that Marshall is running roughshod over their people, that tends to get noticed. So what Marshall does is he sits and goes, OK, look, I can't get a National Guard general there. But what I'll do is I'll take Simpson, who has a good reputation with the Guard, and I'll move him over to command this other division. And... So Simpson's like, I thought I was going to command a corps. And Marshall's like, dude, wait a minute. You'll get it. So Simpson shows up and realizes that no one's doing the right thing. There's all soldiers are dirty. They're not. Uh, everyone needs a haircut. Kind of like me. I need a haircut. Uh, and so he pulls any, everybody in out of the field and he says, guys, I need you to start doing. You know, there's a joke about the right way, the wrong way and the army way. Well, the joke is, is that the army, the reason we have the army way is because that's the repeatable way that we can give to a large number of people quickly. And one of the things he says is haircuts. Now, Simpson had a, had a head much like yours, and he went bald about the same time that you did. And uh, so what he does is that he has his helmet on as he's saying this, and he sweeps off his helmet and says, as you see, I wouldn't ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. <laughs> to general amusement uh, uh, in the team. Now what ended up happening is then soldiers started shaving their heads all the way. And he had to sit there like, guys, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean to shave your heads. But what's interesting is you have this very toxic environment because the division commander was very well liked. Uh, everyone had been together for a while. And Simpson comes in and has to relieve all three regimental commanders. The division staff is very anti-regular army. Uh, a lot of the soldiers are kind of grumpy that who's this regular army officer coming in to do this. And Simpson and uh, Moore have to kind of break through all of that. And they do it reasonably well. Now, they get things going. And then Marshall, this is actually a story about Marshall a little bit, too, come to think of it. Marshall 
once they've kind of turned the corner on training and standards and discipline, Marshall lets Simpson go command the 12th Corps. Then Leland Hobbs, who I'm sure people have uh, heard a lot about, mm -hmm. then steps in to kind of take the 30th Infantry Division the rest of the way. And then they go off and what is it? It's like Roosevelt's Butchers or something like that. Yeah. Uh, they go off and have a stellar reputation. So Marshall did a couple of things there. One, he put a very good commander in place for training standards and discipline. And then he let that guy be the bad guy and do all the hard work, kind of do the hard work to kind of turn that corner. And then Hobbs comes in and now Hobbs doesn't need to be quite the jerk because that's already been done. And Simpson can go command his corps and Hobbs can take advantage of all this. So good stuff there. And uh, ta -ta, he goes, he's going to go command the 12th Corps. I won't spend a lot of time talking about the mobilization training that he does with 12th Corps. But suffice it to say, Simpson and Moore, if you're a CGSC graduate, Command General Staff College graduate, you are their guy and they expect you to do things the CGSC way. And there's a reason for that. We're mass mobilizing our military. We're going from an army that's smaller than Romania's. Now, please understand that Romania's army in 1939 was bigger than it would be today, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was bigger than the United States Army in 1939. And we're going from that small army to a multi-million man force. A lot of these are civilians coming in. This is not the time for fancy, complicated things that maybe seasoned professionals could pull out. You want things that you can hand someone and say, do it this way, always this way, and you can knock it out. And that's what Simpson, and that's kind of what the army does, right? Uh, when we joke about the right way, the wrong way, and the army way. Do it that, do it the army way because everyone's been trained that way. You doesn't matter who trains you. We pull out a manual, do it this way because this school, this school, this school, this school are all producing people. And if everyone's doing their own thing, you put them all together and no one can do anything. Mm -hmm. So all got to be the same. All right, let's push the slide. And just a quick point, two things, what an imp important role Marshall has. So I think he's often overlooked in people's, um, you know, key figures in World War II in that he has, you know, he can do the politics, he can do the organization. He's pretty good with people um, reasonably. Um, and and how imp this transition period is so important as well. I mean, I think when people are thinking of sort of 4041, they're thinking of mechanization, they're thinking of uh, the weaponry coming in more than they're thinking about the army going, as you said, from being very small to very, very large in, in really a matter of, of months. So so this is really good background information. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it's people. This is all people management uh, as you're going through there. So he takes over command of 4th Army. And up there is what you see uh, uh, kind of, I'm not going to go through all of that. But what I will tell you is, is that something to understand very clearly is, and what Simpson gets, is what your job is at Echelon. So echelon, tactical companies, platoons, battalions, regiments, even divisions. Operational, corps, field armies, army groups, and then strategic. Um, and, oh, thank you. Uh, and uh, so as you take a look at it, a field in the United States Army, divisions were the building blocks of the fight. They were the guys doing the hooking and the jabbing. Yes, you can talk about the infantry regiments, and they were doing that too in the combat commands. But really, when the U.S. Army thought about building a fight, building a battle, it was the divisions. The corps were then supposed to supervise those divisions and, you know, hook, you know, punch left, hook right, that kind of thing. The corps were very lean, well, as lean as you can have for a corps headquarters, right? But the idea is, is that a corps was never the same... It was not a set organization. So, yeah. for instance, you can have two divisions in a corps one day. You can have four divisions in the same corps the next day, and they might not even be the same divisions. Uh, and the reason we do that is, is that that way a corps headquarters can focus on one big problem. And then the divisions are just on the ground. And then if you need to folk, you need to kind of like, OK, we're done with this part of the front. A corps headquarters can kind of take over uh, that division that's kind of done. And then you can move another core headquarters around. So when you see these maps and you see the core head, the cores jumping all over the place, yeah, okay, units are also moving too, 
But oftentimes what you see is that it's the core headquarters shifting to where it needs to be and taking over command of the divisions that are actually there. So uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to the Battle of the Bulge. And that's kind of the great example of the American army doing this. But so those are the cores. What the cores are not doing is logistics planning and management. That is the army. The army owns any number of cores. And its job is to do all the administration that the cores can't do. So mail, graves registration, fuel, um, rep uh, repair parts, all of those things that make the army actually happen are done by the army headquarters. And the so the army headquarters is less worried about this hill or that hill, this river. They, they care about big things like a big bridge. Uh, as a for instance, in Normandy, the first army is not really terribly worried about Lafayette Bridge once we're across it. Yeah, it's worried about all the crossings of the Merdure River. It's worried about, you know, they're not terribly worried about what's going on with first of the 506th uh, Parachute Infantry Battalion. They're not worried about, uh, yes, they care, but they're much worried about does the, does the uh, 506 would be what, 101st. Uh, so does the 101st have enough ammunition? Is their mail getting through? When are we, uh, they're on a clock because they're an airborne division and we have to pull them out. That's the kind of thing that they're worrying about. The core, which that would have been 7th Corps uh, that owned the 101st uh, in Normandy. They're not, the the 7th Corps is not terribly worried about all that stuff. They're worried about, okay, take care and take care and time. Go patrolling out. That's what 7th Corps is worried about with the 101st. The 1st Army is worried about Okay, we need to push them ammunition. Okay, uh, we need to, they need more replacements. Oh, uh, we need to set up a field hospital for these guys. Hey, 7th Corps, I want them off the line by this, by this point because Eisenhower has told us that we need to get them off the line and send them back to England. So you see the difference in what you're supposed to do. There's a, there's a distribution of, of tasks. One's kind of focused down and one's focused across and out. Uh, and that's kind of what the army does. All right, so let's slide on to the next one here. So what Simpson's doing during this time frame before he actually goes over to Northwest Europe is he, first off, the Ninth Army is the Eighth Army, which is first the Fourth Army. I hope that's not too, too confusing. <laughs> and his job is to basically certify all the division commanders prior to them going out. And so we've got all these, it's, it's amazing how quickly we put this together, but it's a, it's a checklist of things that all the things all the way down to a soldier level that have to happen. And so his staff's job and his job is to go out and check on these guys and say, Hey, are you doing this? You know, uh, what is it? People only do what you inspect and that's his job. So, and he goes out and enforces the, the army standard to do that. Uh, actually ends up uh, recommending the relief of a division commander because he's like, dude, your staff's untrained. You've had him for a year. At that point, it's not the staff's fault. It's your fault. Leave. Um, and uh, all the myriad things like guys needing shots, uh, guy, you know, eye, eyeglasses. Um <laughs> I'm just going through all the pre-deployment stuff that you, all those million things you have to do. That's his job and his uh, staff's job to do. So he's told, Hey, we need another army in Northwest Europe. So you're going to go take your army. You're going to leave the fourth army behind and you're going to create a new headquarters. And they're the eighth army. He gets a staff. They go to England. And then at that point, uh, he gets to England right around June. And Eisenhower's like, hey, guy, nice, nice that you're here. Don't particularly care. Um, v Day is going on. So even though he's an army commander, he's not that important. And then Eisenhower finally sees him a couple days later and says, hey, hey, Bill, good to see you. And bear in mind that Simpson's actually senior to Eisenhower in terms of time in the army. Eisenhower, I want to say, is like West Point class in 1915. That seems to sound right. Uh, and, but uh, so Eisen, so Simpson's got him by about six years, five, five years, five, six years. I'm 
history teacher, not a math teacher. Uh, and but Eisenhower is the senior guy. And he says, hey, what's, what's your army? He's like, I've got an eighth army. He's like, you can't be eighth army. The Brits have an eighth army and it will cause confusion. You have to change your name. How about the ninth army? Which sounds simple enough, but then you have to think about all the paperwork you have to change, right? <laughs> all the letterheads. <laughs> so like, yeah, <laughs> you can change a six to an eight quite easily, but uh, <laughs> an, an, an eight to an, a nine is hard. <laughs> No, yeah, you're not doing that. So, but he, he's like, okay, I don't care. Fine, I got it. And his job in England is to be what we call now is joint reception, staging, onward movement, and integration. J R S O and I. And what that means is that when somebody arrives in England on a troop ship, they show up at Portsmouth, Liverpool, one of those kind of places. When you step off the, uh, think about when you get off, uh, when you uh, are, when you're traveling and you're arriving at a new place in Europe and all that kind of stuff. When it's just you, it's not that bad, right? But uh, you've done tour groups, right? Mm. Uh, it helps to have somebody kind of there ahead of time to, hi, over this way. Hey, I've got the bus ready. Uh, hey, I've got the hotel uh, all set up. Now imagine that for a division of 15,000 soldiers. That's his headquarters job to do. We're sending over the soldiers and troop ships and we send over their equipment in different ships. So then you have to marry the soldiers up with their stuff. You have to get the cooks, feed them. You have to house them. You have to get the trucks moving because although they've got their own stuff, it's not there. It's on a ship. So you have to do all that. That's what the ninth army is doing uh, as, uh, as they're waiting to go on the continent. And it's, Again, not sexy. <laughs> it's not exciting, but this is the hard government math of large scale warfare. And this is something uh, that Simpson and his division and his headquarters do very, very well is this is all procedural. Do it this way, then this way, then this way. And also what they're doing is, is they're also taking trips across uh, the channel and watching First Army and Third Army as they're preparing for, or the, as they're, they're in First Army, or preparing for Third Army combat operations. And the idea is, is that they're taking the doctrine, they're taking their SOPs, and they're comparing that with what's actually happening on the ground. And they say, oh, does this work? Wow. Doctrine says we should do this. First Army tried it that way. It doesn't very work. Okay, let's change our SOP. Ninth Army, I've got to go back and look, but it's something like a nine-page SOP for a field army headquarters. It doesn't sound like a lot, but as a point of comparison, most U.S. Army brigades these days have SOPs that are a couple hundred pages. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And that's because we like to reiterate our doctrine and our SOPs. There, Simpson goes, no, you should read the doctrine. Here's a manual. Read it. Uh, the SOP is for stuff that's not in doctrine. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide here. All right. So this is kind of showing what's going on as Simpson takes over. Because as you take a look at uh, all the way to the left on that map, you see Brest all the way at the very tip of Brittany there where Ninth Army is. And that's originally Eighth Corps. And Eighth Corps is part of Third Army originally when they're doing the whole breakout from uh, from Nor from the Normandy perimeter. And Eighth Corps had button button hooked uh, out west to to take the Brittany ports, which turns out to not work. But that's a whole nother ball of wax. rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. And then Third Army is the rest of Third Army, the Fifteenth Corps, the Twentieth Corps, and the Twelfth Corps are all headed east as fast as Patton can drive them, quite literally. Well, the problem is, is let's go back to what's an army headquarters supposed to do? Administration, logistics, all this kind of stuff. Well, Patton's trying to now command and control across the breadth of France by the time he gets to Metz. And Patton's good, but really what he ends up doing is, is he kind of leads 8th Corps to his own devices. That's Middleton, by the way. Yeah. Uh, um, now, Middleton's a good commander, but he doesn't have the assets that he needs. And... He's asking for logistics, but because he doesn't have kind of that middle headquarters to help him out, stupid things happen. Like they open up one of the uh, ports around uh, just to the north of him. And 
they they just drop off some artillery ammunition, but they drop off artillery ammunition that's just come from the states. Artillery ammunition, big art, artillery ammunition, not 105s, but 155, 8 inch, all that kind of stuff, is shipped in the fuse, the body, and uh, fuse body and propellant. Uh, well, that's great. And you ship them separately because if you put them together, things go boom a little bit too soon and people get grumpy. And there you go. Um, and so what they do is a ship pulls up from the United States and offloads all the eight inch artillery ammunition. And he's like, great. I can start reducing the, the fortifications abreast. Where are the fuses and the propellant? Oh, those are on a different ship. What? Well, <laughs> You just asked for artillery ammunition. We gave you the artillery ammunition. So this is what an army headquarters is designed to do and fix. And that's why Middleton needs somebody to take care of him. So that's why Simpson shows up. And Simpson goes over there and says, okay, Middleton, what do you need? And Middleton's like, look, I've got the fight. I know how to take a city. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be hard. But I need someone to handle all the rest of this stuff. <laughs> because I'm trying to do too much. I don't have the right people. I don't have the right units because you need truck units, all this kind of stuff. I'm, I, I need you to do that. So that's what Simpson and his uh, staff does. They've got three cores. They've got the third core, which is doing J-R-S-O-N-I. And I have to say that that deliberately because I can never say it fast in Normandy. They have, I want to say the 13th core doing J-R-S-O-N-I in England. And then they've got the eighth core. Well, think about it this way. If you've ever had that boss where there's only one interesting thing going on in the, uh, in the department, where do you think that boss typically is? Standing over your shoulder going, what you doing? How you doing? <laughs> uh, and Simpson very deliberately does not do that. He does go forward. He does check and see how the eighth core is doing. But then he gets out. He Then he finds out what they need. And then he gets out of their way. Uh, because... That's what a job, that's what a boss should do. I mean, what's what's funny about Simpson is, is that every time I, you say it, it's like this great revelation, then you look at all the books and say, oh, he just did what the book said. <laughs> Shocking, Ooh. right? Uh, and so Middleton's fighting that fight. Quick story down on the southern end there. So there's some Germans uh, trying to retreat out of uh, southwest France around the Bordeaux area. And this is a couple divisions, core minus a lot. And a patrol from one of the infantry divisions that's down there finds the uh, this German force, and it's this lieutenant that's originally finds him. I think it's Lieutenant McGill. I've got it in the book. But... And the lieutenant's like, um, you want to surrender? And the Germans really want to surrender, but they want to pro forma a battle. This is a decision of well above the pay grade of a second lieutenant or even a first lieutenant to deal with. So he calls up his battalion and says, help. Town calls up the core, you know, all up the chain. And then Simpson says, hey, guys, what do you need? And they say, we need airplanes. Like, I don't have airplanes. I'm like, but this is what we need. So he calls up Third Army, basically calls in a favor with Patton and uh, with uh, Pete Casada, Ninth Air Force commander. That right? Yeah. And then, uh, no, not not Ninth Air Force. That's Casada's Patton's guy. Um, and then, uh, but it calls up, calls in some favors with the army air forces and they get aircraft flying over these Germans and they make them surrender. And so this division is processing basically this core minus into captivity and they call up the ninth army headquarters. I'm like, do you, do you want to come down here? You know, general officer watching all the Germans march off into captivity and Simpson and his team are like, no, you got it. Your win. We're handling our business. You handle your business. Do you have, a, do you need trucks? Do you need more people? No, I'm good. Okay, and lets him have the win. Same thing at Brest. Simpson is around, but who receives the surrender at Brest? It's Middleton and his subordinates. There's the famous uh, line of uh, when an uh, American general points to his soldiers, they, when the, like, who, where are your credentials? He says, these are my credentials, and he points to his soldiers. Uh, it's a great line. Um, but Simpson's not there. There's no picture of patents of Simpson striding across the ruins of Britain of uh, of Brest. Why? He's busy making sure his staff is doing the things that need doing at mm -hmm. an headquarters. Mm -hmm. You have a ruined city. If you've thought about all the administration that has to go into administering a ruined city, civilians have to be fed. German, you've captured these Germans. We're not 
we're not the Nazis, so we're not going to just stick them in camps and let them starve and die of their wounds. We're going to take care of them. We have to evacuate. We have to evacuate them. We have our own wounded. We have to take care of. We have to bury the dead. All of these things have to happen, and Middleton's Corps can't do it. So that's what Simpson's Army headquarters is doing. Now, is this special to the Ninth Army? No. Every Army headquarters does this, but Simpson's is significant in that it does it so efficiently. They really, really are known for this. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the next one real quick. All right, so that kind of covers what we talked about there, but uh, this just kind of shows you some numbers here. 450 miles of front. And uh, when I originally made this slide, I was uh, talking to folks in Kansas, which is why the, uh, the distance there is from Manhattan, Kansas to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Probably doesn't mean much. I'll take your word for that. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it sounds right to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a point of reference, that is basically along the Loire River, almost all the way to Paris and then all the way and then covering the Brittany ports from uh, what is it? Uh, Nance all the way forward, all the way up to, uh, to Brest. And just looking at the numbers there, 38,000 Germans just in Brest, 20,000 Germans uh, leaving uh, Bordeaux. These are huge numbers, and we think, oh, that's great. And then we think about, well, what do you do with them? Now, if you're the Nazis, you know, we talk about, you know, capturing 500, 600,000, whatever Soviets in Barbarossa, we know what happened to them, right? Many of them starved, some of them escaped, some of them were shot. Many of them were shot. We don't do now. That's not to say the Americans didn't shoot prisoners uh, during World War II. That did happen. We all know that happened. However, it was not a matter of policy. And as uh, we, uh, so you have to care for all these things. And we think about that, that's 58,000 people. That's what a decent sized city <laughs> uh, that you now have to care for, feed, evacuate, and they have become your responsibility. All right, let's move on. All right. So, now that Simpson is told, get his army all the way across France. No problem. Uh, I, I don't know. How, maybe you might know uh, how many hours it is driving from uh, Brest all the way out to uh, call it the uh, Bastogne, but probably a good day's drive. Yeah, 30 back then. Yeah. These yeah you can and, do it in about 10 hours, but yeah. Oh, yeah. So 1,100 miles, they have to get all the stuff over there. And Simpson originally takes over. He doesn't, uh, and he brings the 8th Corps with him. And he relieves the 5th Corps in the uh, Ardennes there. And yeah, everyone's like, wait, the 9th Army's in the Ardennes. Hold on, wait. Yeah. The idea is, is that 1st Army was to the north. 3rd Army was to the south. There was this big gap. They were going to put the 9th Army in the middle. There you go. Now, this is where politics starts coming in. We can take as kind of a matter of course that Patton and Montgomery didn't really get along very nicely together. Right. <laughs> it's very well documented throughout there. Sometimes it's overplayed for dramatic effect in the movies, yeah. but sometimes it's underplayed. Um, there's a really good book uh, by John Nelson Ricard called Ford with Patton. And it's the diary of uh, one of Patton's deputy G2s, um, Colonel Allen, the guy that wrote um, Lucky Ford. But yep. Lucky Ford was the heavily edited version, and if you've and if you've read Ford with Pat, and you realize just how heavily edited that was, and okay, some of the stuff may have not have seen the light of day. But long story short, we know that Patton did not get along with Montgomery. What's less well known, perhaps, unless you've studied, perhaps, is Montgomery and Bradley didn't get along, and that's really where the fight's occurring. Is that Bradley and Montgomery are fighting each other back and forth? And they're, uh, they're, they're feuding over things they do not get along. Each one thinks they need to be the main effort. Each one is uh, trying to steal resources from the other. And Montgomery's on the winning side of that art, is going to be on the winning side of that argument. If you look at the map, you see where the, where the British, uh, where the 21st Army Group is. I really can't say British. They're Canadians. There's Poles. Yeah. Uh, but the 21st Army Group that's up there. And... They're pointed at the Ruhr. That is the primary geographic objective that the Shafe is oriented on. He's going to be the main effort. Montgomery's going through problems. He doesn't have a lot of combat. Yeah, he's running out of soldiers. This is about where you start to see divisions get taken apart to keep yeah, other yeah. divisions in the line. So Montgomery is telling is agitating to Eisenhower to give him a field army. 
Well, do the math. Do the do the do the battlefield geometry math. You're gonna put the army headquarters that's next to Montgomery in the. <laughs> you're gonna give that to Montgomery. No, everybody north of the Ardennes. Well, that's that's Hodge's first army. Bradley's not going to give up. That, remember, that's Bradley's army. That's the army Bradley built basically from scratch. Well, not quite from scratch, but almost. It was the army he commanded in the in the in Normandy. Those are his boys. Also, by the way, the first army staff were also many of them veterans of the second corps staff from the Mediterranean. And oh, by the way, what that means is that all of these guys have been working with the Brits and Montgomery for a while. And many of them, um, how should we put this? Didn't get along well. Don't, don't play nice with the Brits. <laughs> it's a good way a to put it. Strange. Yeah, a bit strange. Uh, a bit strange. So there's personal reasons and professional reasons for not putting that army underneath 21st Army Group. So so Bradley tells Simpson, hey, I know it's great that you just moved 1,100 miles uh, and got everything just all set up and got all these tons of supplies, 15,000 tons. I need you to move to the other end of the line because if I lose an army, I'd rather it be you than the first army. Think about that one for a minute. <laughs> so slide, please. And this is where it gets funny. So you see the Ninth Army up there jammed between the first and the third, first in the army and the 21st Army group. And what's funny here is that what they did is they just moved headquarters. Because remember, we were talking about modular headquarters. Well, first, and they decided instead of moving all the supplies, they were just going to trade supply dump for supply dump. So First Army, being the wonderful people that they were, decided to laterally transfer all the stuff from the supply dumps they were giving to Ninth Army to other supply dumps. So when Ninth Army shows up, they go, where's the stuff in the supply? Oh, out there it's gone <laughs> gee thanks appreciate that guys but simpson lets it go he sits and goes guys first army is the main effort this is uh, during the battle of the hurtkin forest uh mm -hmm. this is in november this is in late october early november and he's like first army is the main effort yeah it was kind of a jerk move but we the enemy is out there we're going to just keep moving forward so slide, please. So, oh, by the way, they also have to do the November offensive. And I've, I use the term the November offensive. I don't think anybody else does, but this was an offensive, basically a cascading series of offenses, uh, offensives all the way through the 21st Army Group, all the way down darn near to the Swiss border during November. And no one talks about it because it's ugly, hard, and muddy. If you talk about November, it's all about the Hurtkin Forest, which was also happening during then. It was happening before and after too. But, uh, but, uh, and the idea is, is that you've got, is that everyone's trying to push because Eisenhower wants to keep the, the stress on. And Simpson and his staff are like, okay, we have six divisions in a space for three. So that's traffic management. And then mud, because, uh, you know, we were talking about snow out there. And you talk about, well, who cares about mud? Well, if you've ever driven off road and then driven onto a road, what do you bring with you? Mud. Well, what uh, if you've ever driven on a road with mud? And I know, I I know you have because you live in uh, Normandy. Uh, all those farmers dragging the stuff onto the driven road. Driven in it, got stuck in it. Yeah. If you don't do something about it, you're you're stuck. And well, who? And the the comment is somebody ought to do something about that. Well, in France, now it's the department. I think it's the department's job to, to handle that or the city, depending on where it is. Yep. But they're not doing that now. So somebody has to do that. It's the Army's job. And they're right on the border. And a quick uh, quick war story here with Gailen Kirkin is Gailen Kirkin is right on the Army Group boundary. You've got 30th Corps to the north. You've got nine, uh, British 30th Corps. And then you got the American uh, 13th Corps just to the south. And the problem is, is that the U.S. Army is still dealing with severe artillery ammunition shortages. The Red Ball Express, we've all talked about this now. And what ends up happening is, is that the Americans have plenty of infantry. They've got the whole brand new 84th Infantry Division they're going to commit into this fight. But their artillery ammunition is sucking. The Brits, on the other hand, they're closer to the channel ports. they got lots of artillery, but not enough infantry. 
So rather than tell the Brits, give me your stuff, Simpson looks at, uh, I think it's Horrocks, and uh, Simpson goes, hey, how about I just give you a division? That way, all your systems and you can bring in the 43rd division. Uh, was it the Wessex division? Is that right? Yep, that's right. Yep. Uh, the, the 43rd division, and you can you can command and control this fight. You're going to provide the predominant uh, predominance of the firepower. It's your fight. Have a division. And that strikes you, you know, it's like giving freely. Army commanders don't typically do that. Patton will give up a division and he cries and whines. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't get me wrong. I love me Patton, but uh, yeah, his, uh, his uh, diary is just full of anytime somebody tells him to give something up, he is always, he's railing on and on. Not a sharer. Yeah. Doesn't like to share. Uh, same thing with the First Army. Simpson goes, yeah, in fact, why don't you run it? I'd like the division back, please, but run it. Now, this is, of course, a Eisenhower decision because it's not just two armies working together. This is in a, across an army group boundary. So what Simpson does is that Eisenhower is coming in for a briefing on the offensive and all the staff's work's already gone into play. And Eisen and Simpson kind of tells Eisenhower, hey, boss, um, we're thinking about maybe what do you think about the idea of, uh, you know, having the 84th work for the for, work for 30 Corps for this operation? And, Simpson, and Eisenhower's like, yeah, that's a great idea. I like that. So what's funny is, is that in the in Eisenhower's recollections that I found in the sources, Eisenhower had this spontaneous idea to have the Americans provide a division to the Brits. <laughs> and uh, uh, Eisenhower and Horrocks, are, or Simpson and Horrocks, are sitting there going, yeah, great idea, boss. Glad you came up with it. We'll execute it. It's working your boss, right? Um, Air and ground operations. So 30th Infantry Division. Back again, they'd uh, they'd suffered heavily during Operation Cobra. For those that uh, remember the the short bombings, the 30th yeah. had lost the better part of a battalion in those short bombings. So when they're getting ready to go across the line of departure, the commander of the 30th Infantry Division tells Simpson, um, "You're not planning on using heavy bombers, are you?" Well, First Army is. Like, I don't want anything part of that. So what Simpson's like? Oh, that's a really good idea. We had pr some problems with that. So what does he do? He puts his air commander. His fire, his artillery commander, and his ground commanders all in the same room when they figure it out. Again, this ain't rocket science. This is what we teach at the schoolhouse. But the problem is, is that a lot of times people will try and do the shortcuts. Somebody has a good idea, and we're just going to execute that rather than just do it the way we taught you. And uh, so. This is, of course, a hard, bloody fight. This is going up to the Roar River. And if you ever, there, there are some good books on the topic there. But honestly, very undercovered in the literature because mm. wants to talk about basically grinding your way forward. Um, quick note on that, though, is that Ernie Harmon, commander of the 2nd Armored Division, is working for Simpson during this time frame. And he's starting to freak out because he's got an armored division fighting through mud. And he's seen the commander of the 3rd Armored Division get fired. Bear in mind that there was like 15 or so American general officers fired in uh, World War II, division commanders and above, in the Northwest European theater. And uh, there's a great book called, Command, or not book, uh, article called Command Climate in the United States uh, 12th Army Group. Uh, 12th Army? 1st Army. 1st Army, I think it is. And it's third, Patton fires two. Jones and P. Woods, or that's not his first name, but he, go, he goes by the nickname P as in Professor. Yep, yeah, yeah. And Hodges and Bradley fire something like 13. So uh, that's kind of a, you know, kind of stick it in some people that think that Patton is this toxic commander. Well, he didn't really fire that many people. Hodges, on the other hand, fires all sorts of folks. So Ernie Harmon is freaking out that he's going to get fired because he's... Uh, he, got a new boss and he's sitting there going, I'm going to, I'm going to get stuck in the mud. I'm going to track armor and it's going to be a mess and I'm going to get fired. And Simpson calls him in and says, Hey man, I got you. You're great. You're a great, good commander. In fact, you're the best armor commander I know. And that includes Patton. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to kind of puff Ernie up. Right. So 
Um, this is a, it's stuff, it's the small personal leadership things that go along through these things. Uh, Ernie's starting to get a kind of close to the edge as the fighting goes on. Simpson calls him up and this is not, this is 1944. So we don't have general order number one and Ernie Harmon's getting kind of getting close to the edge. He's about ready to lose it, about ready to crack wide open. And Simpson calls him up like, Hey man, you're, you're going to be my, my guest. So, and what do they do? They drink highballs and tell war stories. Because it's better to have a division commander nurse a hangover than to have him become a, a, a mental casualty. And just that emotional maturity and an emotional intelligence to understand that, hey, look, this guy might be your go-to player. It might be a tough spot, but hey, off we go. Um, just on the first army bullet there, that's just funny. They realized that they couldn't cross the Roar River until we controlled the Roar River dams. So he sends his G3 operations officer to tell the first army, hey, guys, what's your plan? And uh, Hodges and his uh, staff say, hey, thank you for your interest in national defense. Uh, mind your own business. We'll get to it when we get to it. And so they spend all this time slamming their head in the Hurtkin forest rather than realizing if they'd gone up to Monchal, they could have like hmm. taken the dams and outflank and turned the position of the Hurtkin forest, um, which they will discover belatedly in December, which is what fifth Corps is actually doing on the morning of, uh, 16 December. All right, let's get, let's move on to the next slide. I realize I'm, I'm telling all sorts of war stories. That I mean, well, that's very good. No, that's, we're loving it. All right. So, um, battle of the bulge happens. Ninth army doesn't do much doing there, but here's the thing morning, like the 16th of December. And now there's some confusion in the sources here, but, uh, this is what I think reasonably happened. Because some of the sources say Bradley ordered it directly. Others say Hodges called first. I'm going to go with Hodges called first because this is that makes the most sense. Because Bradley was down in Luxembourg City. Hodges was in Spa. So I can see Hodges calling Simpson direct. But Hodges calls up Simpson freaking out going, <laughs> I'm getting overrun. I need help, please. And Simpson doesn't even wait for the order. He says, what do you need? Like, Whatever reserves you can have. At that point, Simpson's got one division off the line. It's the 7th Armored Division. He says, fine, they're yours. Off they go. 7th Armored Division is going to go into St. Vith. Uh, and uh, basically, personal opinion, uh, the St. Vith uh, fighting is significantly more important than Bastogne. Uh, because Bastogne, while interesting and while an important road junction, was not in the direction the Germans needed to go. The Germans needed the shortcut across uh the Ardennes to get to uh is it Liege? Liege? Yeah, Liege, yeah. Uh and and to get across the Meuse that way. If the, if you're, if they're in Bastogne, they've kind of it's kind of beside the point already. That said, so the 7th Armored Division fights there. The records also show that Patton also released the 10th Armored Division to go fight in Bastogne. Now uh, I just uh, I just saw Kevin Heimel's uh, new book and also his talk with you about uh, that some of the stuff in Patton's diaries may have been added in a little bit later. Amended, changed, exaggerated. But, but what's interesting is, is that Patton, so I've got to, I'd actually want to have a talk with Kevin and see how much of this was added in. But, but Patton actually is very frustrated about having to give up the 10th Armored Division. And so that is in his notes that I... Uh, we should have just kept, I should have just kept the 10th Armored Division. Bradley's taking it, uh, taking counsel of the spheres on and on and on. Grump, 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 grump. Just two very different perspectives. They both work though. And so 9th Army is sending all of its combat power just freely and willingly down to uh, help out uh, the 1st Army during this. And in fact, they're also telling 1st Army, look, don't worry about the admin. You just fight your battle. We'll take care of their mail. We'll even push logistics down there. They do have to send some officers along because First Army tends to try and steal their trucks. So <laughs> you're a good dude, but you're not that good of a dude. <laughs> you know, like you can stay at my house, but you can't. You know, you can't put it out for rent. So, uh, so that's what they do over the summer there, now or over the winter. Excuse me, different season. Now, when Montgomery takes over the northern half of the bulge for those that are familiar the first and the ninth armies go to the bulge because i because bradley has set up in luxembourg city so as soon as the germans penetrate bradley can't talk to the first army headquarters or the ninth army headquarters so eisenhower puts him in charge 
all the records say that when Montgomery showed up to the first army headquarters, the reception was, um, cold <laughs> and, uh, the talk about, you know, uh, there, there's a great quote about Montgomery shows up, uh, looking like he's Christ coming to cleanse the temple and all this kind of stuff. Just everyone's <laughs> unhappy. <laughs> There, there, there aren't a lot of happy faces when the First Army and, the, and Montgomery uh, come up together. Ninth Army, on the other hand, is like, yep. Hey, boss, good to see you. Now, again, different scenarios, right? Ninth Army's not the one in trouble. Ninth Army also all, has built has taken the time to build a good working relationship with the British forces. They're used to each other. They kind of know each other already. So it's a different a dynamic going on there but yeah it's just one is very very cold very barely correct and i think much to montgomery's credit i think uh he doesn't push too hard with first army mm -hmm. uh and kind of backs off a little bit which is which is interesting and there's all sorts of good stuff in there the bitter woods uh are you familiar with that one uh yeah john, yeah. john sd eisenhower i think is probably the best narrative of that all right, so let's move on to the next slide here. Okay, so grenade. And this is where we're, there's a little bit of controversy here because they have to cross the Royal River and they have to go and then assault to the Rhine. Now, the problem is, is this, they're fighting underneath the 21st Army Group at this point. So when 1st Army goes back to the 12th, Simpson and his headquarters stay there. Well, the problem is that the ninth, the first army didn't take the Royal River dams in time, and the Germans opened the dams. So this is also February of forty-five. So you, the the Royal River is in a state of flood, and you can get we're like, well, why don't you just get on a boat and get across? The problem is, is that when the, the river is a, at a high rate of flow, high river water level, what you're doing is you are risking something breaking on the far side so you you have to wait for the water to drop a certain uh, drop to acceptable levels and you have to get the flow rate down because if you've ever tried to build a bridge in the middle of a swiftly flowing river it's not easy and if you're trying to do it under fire it's really not easy and then there's that great scene from um uh, a bridge too far where they get where the air where the 80 seconds paddling across what doesn't show is how far down the river they drifted and this is going to be a hard thing. Well, Montgomery launches uh, Operation Veritable on time. And Ninth Army is held up. What this means is that Ninth Army is that the, uh, the, the British Second Army is actually bleeding, going through the Reichswald, going through all this kind of stuff. Well, Ninth Army is kind of just sitting there <laughs> and doesn't look great. But the other option is, is do you want us to attack and get stuffed and lose all of our bridging equipment in a failed crossing attempt? So um, this is one of those cases where Simpson goes as soon as it's possible. He actually gives his division or his army engineer almost a nervous breakdown because the army engineer has to report to the chief of staff four times a day of the river flow rate, <laughs> uh, getting to acceptable limits. And again, this is all, del and while they're doing that, they're going over all these things. And these are things that if you've been to a staff college are simple things. You brief the plan, the subordinates go make their own plans. They come back and they back brief you and each other on what their plans are. And then you go sit around a table with the boss and you talk over the what ifs. So if this happens, then what, I, what hey boss, where's kind of your thoughts on this? Where's kind of, where, where's your head on this? Because mission command, as the army says, there's three kinds. There's really only one, but I joke there's three. The first is the subordinate doing what they want and not wanting to be told what they uh, told what to do. That's the problem is you can desynchronize all sorts of stuff. Again, two and a half artillery shells per yard of front for mm -hmm. an hour. Think about that one for a second. You don't want to just go Leroy Jenkins and freestyle in it. Two is a higher headquarters not doing its job and just saying, oh, we're going to mission command this, meaning eh, subordinates figure it out. I'm not doing my job. And the third is everyone understands what's going on their left, right, front, back. And I understand when I make this decision or pull this lever, here are the second and the third order effects, and here are the people I have to call. That's what the Ninth Army is doing. Again, 
This ain't rocket science. We teach this at Leavenworth. This is, but shockingly, it works. Uh, and when the roar, you see it. The 13th Corps crosses the Roar River, and they're supposed to un, uh, clear the uh, river in front of the 16th Corps so the 16th Corps doesn't have to do an assault crossing. 13th Corps gets ahead of schedule and knows that they've already had the conversation with the boss that if I'm ahead of schedule, just tell 16th Corps to execute. So not they call 9th Army, but before they call 9th Army, they call 16th Corps just lateral. Hey, buddy, go ahead and cross. I got you covered. Then they tell the higher headquarters speed it up but you can do that because everyone's familiar with the plan everyone knows what's going on it's also as an interesting aside 16th corps was the designated assault crossing for the uh rhine so you didn't want two assault crossings because those are brutally hard to execute so you've got one core they only have to think about one rhine crossing all right let's move on to the next one here real quick I guess a couple of questions. Um, Phil Blood, the esteemed Dr. Philip Blood, did First Army ignore the obvious or make poor decisions? Depends on how charitable you want to be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> bottom line, uh, because I am not a huge fan of the First Army in terms of its operational decision making. I'll give them the credit when they're do when they're urged to do the Battle of the Mons pocket, superbly executed. Uh, how much of that is Collins doing his own thing? Hmm. You can you can have that uh, you have that in there and dragging along the army. First Army doesn't really ever seem to fight as an army very frequently. So, is it bad decision making or ignoring the obvious? I jokingly say ignoring the obvious because I'm kind of hinting at bad decision, but <laughs> really, <laughs> it, 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 it's up to the eye of the beholder there. Okay, and another one from Terry Down. You kind of half covered this. I think Montgomery took credit for ordering Simpson across the swiftly flowing world when Simpson hesitated. Is this true that Monty made the decision? Um, I've seen that in the literature, and I don't know if I fully buy it. And here's why: Simpson was a deliberate, careful guy. He didn't struggle to make decisions. Okay. And uh, I, I, I've seen that comment there, and I think it actually comes from. Uh, is it a uh, de Guingand or maybe uh, maybe Horrocks? I can't remember with, uh, without going back and looking at the notes. But it it just doesn't match with. Uh, first off, none of the American sources would say that. Now they wouldn't. Right. Um, but and I I've only seen it really in one British source uh, that I could track it back to an individual. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, I've seen it repeated a couple of times. Bottom line, probably not. Uh, okay. I say I say probably not just simply because Simpson didn't struggle to make a decision when they were going to cross. Simpson was not trying to make the second British army bleed any more than they had to. Um, so I think as soon as it was possible, he was going to go. I think that Montgomery may have looked at him and he may have looked at him and said, can you go? And the answer is yes. And Montgomery then took that as ordering. Okay. Uh, big personalities tend to interpret things their own ways. Good point. Moving on across the okay. Rhine. So uh, getting across the Rhine, and I'm I'm I promise I'm, we're, we're getting there, right? Um, so this is an interesting one because the Americans get to the Rhine, and Montgomery's original plan is, is that a corps will fight for the British Second Army, and crossing the Rhine will be an entirely British commanded operation, even though almost all the bridging is going to come from the American Ninth Army. And that's kind of a it sort of makes sense that you want one army headquarters in command of all the crossings of the Rhine. That makes sense. But it's also kind of a finger in the eye of the ninth army a little bit because crossing the Rhine is kind of like the Super Bowl, right? It's the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is what everyone's been preparing for. It's the moment. And it's McGovern. Mark Clark got over. his Rome with his fifth army, didn't he? You know, you've got to get, you've got to have your kind of cheerleader moment. Yeah. And Simpson kind of goes, dude, you're using my soldiers, my bridging equipment. Why can't my headquarters do it? Now, what's interesting is that he talks to Dempsey about it. And Dem Dempsey, Second Army, yeah. Um, and they kind of look each other in the eye and go, yeah, we agree. So Simpson, what Simpson doesn't do is he doesn't go crying to Bradley. He doesn't go crying to Eisenhower. He takes it up with his chain of command. Again, that's what we teach. But, he, but uh, even though it's a British commander doing it, he doesn't. Again, you just keep it, you do the right thing, and shockingly, it works. 
And Montgomery sits and goes, ah, well, I don't, I don't agree entirely, but they change it. And Ninth Army gets across. Now there's the Bustle Bridge, and this is the part where I've been telling the story about how Simpson's doing the right thing, doing the staff work. This is the part where Simpson kind of loses his temper right here. And it was the Wessel Bridge and the second Ar the British Second Army and U.S. Ninth Army both needed the bridge. And it was one bridge. And the idea was is Ninth Army would build it. They would hand it to Second Army. Second Army would have it for a while. Then Ninth Army would get it back. Well, turns out that and there was kind of a gentleman's handshake agreement. And then it was one of those things where Second Army kept it a little bit longer than they should have. And Ninth Army is now starting to get very, very frustrated <laughs> because they're like, guys, we're in a fight, too. We need our bridge back. We built it. We want it back. To be fair, when Dempsey doesn't immediately respond, Simpson goes to Montgomery. Again, you're going up to the chain of command. And Montgomery, again, to his credit, tells Dempsey to get off the bridge. So... And there's a handshake later uh, where there's the I think there are some more hard feelings amongst the staff than maybe the commanders. Uh, Dempsey and Simpson shake hands afterwards, and they they like they let it go. But uh, so so there's some so this is not you know the perfect relationship. There are there are tensions. This is not like Simpson's just Simpson can is better than everybody when it comes to working with coalition partners. Now he has his moments too. Last thing I'll say on this one is the 16th Corps. So Anderson's across, and he's a new Corps commander, and he's having a tr he's having a tough fight. Some of it's he's new. Some of it we've got a new division, the Eighth Armor Division, Eighth U.S. Armor Division, is uh, having a fight. They're in a problem. And Anderson, I got a letter from Anderson. He's like, I think I'm going to get fired. Simpson is actually. I've got the note in an interview where Simpson and Moore are saying, Do I have to fire the Anderson? And Simpson's like, no, let, 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 let's hold, let, let's wait what we got. And then it works. And the thing here is, is that it shows kind of that, again, that uh, emotional intelligence of your subordinates in a tough spot. Maybe he's not doing the best job, but let him grow, let him deal with it. Let him kind of work through it because maybe you're going to screw things up worse by changing out the uh, uh, horse in the middle of the fight. And Simpson was a lot more willing to do that. Hodges, on the other hand, fired the only Corps commander to successfully seize a Rhine bridge. Milliken. Milliken seizes the bridge at Remagen. And Courtney Hodges shows up and is upset with the chaos around the bridge, as one might expect when all of a sudden you hadn't been planning at taking one, now you do, and fires Milliken. Now Van Fleet does a great job afterwards, but... Mm. I don't know why. I mean, Milliken's also the guy that really best owned. So, whatever. All right, slide. Just good. Just a frame of reference. When we when we're coming out of that winter of 44, 45, if there are strains between some of the commanders, which there clearly were, there were strains across the ETO. Genuinely, I mean, this is the this is the peak period for desertions, the peak period for crimes. You come out of the worst winter of a trench foot. I'm talking about the American Army, British Army, Canadian Army. You know, everyone's getting a bit, we would say, in England knackered. Everyone's, can, they can kind of see the end is there, but everyone's just fed up and miserable. The, the weather isn't helping. So, you know, just some context. No one's, no one's running at their best, February, yeah, March, no, 45, I would say. Yeah, no one, no one is exactly what you call um, pleasant to be around right now. Yeah, <laughs> everyone's a bit uh, grouchy. Yeah. Uh, and, and the Amer I mean, and on this, the American army, you know, they'll, they'll fire a thousand rounds a minute rather than send out infantry over to do this. Yeah. Okay, so just closing up real quick is, is this just shows Ninth Army is attacking across here. And again, the point that I'll highlight here is that Ninth Army is managing the administrative action here. You think about, we talk about 260,000 artillery shells in two weeks. And everyone goes, wow, it's a lot of explosions. Yes. Think about the trucks. Think about the, the the roads. Just think about how many truck how many truckloads that is, how yeah. many round turns that is, how many ships that is. Um, getting it to the artillery batteries. You're not just all sitting in one place. This is not World War One, where you where they can build a railroad up to your <laughs> up to your artillery position. This is constant movement forward. So this is again admit. This is 
administration and logistics being handled at its finest. So that's uh, that's what I'll kind of highlight there. The one thing I'll also point out is that they leave 16th Corps behind. Again, one core handles one big problem, and then the other two cores go assault onto the Elbe River from there. Okay, so slide. All right. So Ninth Army. The idea being is is that I love me I love me some Patton. I love me some Montgomery, and I think that oftentimes the, they've kind of gotten the. Um, They've been uh, unfairly represented because you don't get to the position of an army group headquarters, um, army group commander and army headquarters unless you're the best. Right. Montgomery, for his many faults or his, all the kind of stuff, was a highly successful general officer. He did his job. I mean, he was very good at what he did. So when you see these uh, when you see him push, uh, say, hey, why won't you listen to me? I mean, people are dying. I mean, you want, and when uh, if, you, if when you get to that level, you know, ego kind of comes with the job. <laughs> so uh, when, when Montgomery and when Patton or when Bradley are all pushing for this, it's not just so I can make a bigger splash. It's they genuinely, truly do believe that their way will end the war faster. So I really kind of have to always kind of proceed all these commentaries with these guys aren't just being jerks. They're going they truly believe they're going to end the war for, uh, uh, if, the, if people will listen to them. But that said, we read lots of books on Montgomery. We read lots of books on Patton. More of our units were led by Simpson type personalities. And that's one of those things that it's not about me. It's about the unit. It's about getting the job done. Uh, it's the that utility infield your guy, you know, is is not like the star player that I can only do one thing. And when I'm not doing that one thing, I'm gonna just sit there and sulk. Uh, you know, he he's able to be, you know. Work through it when you talk about, you know, everyone's kind of a, having a, like everyone's not at their best. Right. Think about the personality required to deal with people not at their best and not make it worse. You know, when everyone's short on sleep and you're on you're working on two or three hours and you're frustrated and you're angry, it doesn't take that. And sometimes you almost want to. Right. You almost want to poke someone uh, just because you're so frustrated and angry the maturity to not. Mm. And that is what I think has been missing uh, in a lot of the narrative of these big personalities. Cause we like talking about the arguments, right? You know, people like the drama. Uh, it's like the Jersey shore, but you know, in world war two, uh, but there's so many other people that aren't doing that, that I think sometimes we think that everyone was doing that when in reality, it was a couple big personalities and many other people weren't. Well, well even, even the ones who are doing that, even the big personalities, we're still talking about the moments when they clash. That's what sells books. That's what that's what provokes um, conversation, you know. And people like James Holland talk about the fact you can find plenty of quotes about Montgomery saying bad things about Bradley and Bradley saying bad things about Patton and Patton saying bad things about that. But you can also find minutes of lots of meetings where they sat there and kind of got on with each other. You know, it, yeah. it, 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 it's it's what you're looking for. And, you know, as you said, you made a very good point that, that all of these leaders are trying to do their best. They're trying to win the war in the most efficient way possible. They're, 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 they're having different levels of success depending on what the enemies say in the battle is and depending on other circumstances but we we get a little bit obsessed with bashing them sometimes these days and this this guy here is a you know a prima donna this guy here is a whatever but anyway brilliant stuff or, or, um, we, or we pick our side right uh, or we, we a montgomery fan or a uh, or, oh, a, uh, or if a i've learned one thing doing this is people are absolutely entrenched the people that love macarthur won't have anything against him the people that hate macarthur yeah it, it, it people are very very you know binary about this and um there you are but um we've got a couple of questions bill um okay. Peter O'Connell was said a few minutes ago, is ageism alert? Any thoughts about relationships being between less than optimal performance as a function of the advancing age of some of the US ex First World War officers running these vast armies? I mean, they are. Simpson was getting getting on a little bit. I mean, not, although he was, you know, a, a, clearly a good performer, but does, do you think age comes into anything at all? Um, 
Some. And what's interesting is, is that Marshall actually has a hard limit in terms of age. Uh, he actually fires several. In fact, most of the National Guard generals are removed from command because Simpson, not Simpson, Marshall says, hey, look, command of a division is a young man's game and removes them. Um, I think it's not so much that their energy level is hurting in terms of that. What I think it's more along, you're, you're that balance between maturity and experience versus um uh how much uh how much energy you have to keep going it's it's the age old thing in sport whether it's fo football your football soccer whatever is you know when when do you take off the veteran guy who's steadying the ship and bring the young flair player on at what point is the moment to blood that young guy and when you know do you do you put the experience guy on for the first half and bring the young guy on for the second half or the other way around? There's no there's no uh, simple or easy answer to these questions, is there? Yeah, Brett Favre was still winning games uh, <laughs> for, for, for quite some time. But yeah, it, it's one of those things that's like, I think it's more about the personalities uh, that you really kind of come into it. It's... And what's, what's really amazing to me is, is that some of these guys, the reason they were there was because they were literally the guys that were there, if that makes sense. It was... They had a level of seniority. They were ahead to reach the right level of uh, skill. And then you got to go out and try it. No one's commanded. A, no one had commanded a field army, in the United States Army. In 1940. Well, the last guy that did was uh, Pershing and talk about, you know, too old for the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Pershing had was too old for it. Um, uh, so you really think about the uh, these guys and they all just kind of have to step up and move past it and do the best thing and the best they can. And one last thing they'll just highlight here is we, uh, we talk a lot about the tactics and the battles and all that kind of stuff. But what, what I think needs to be highlighted is the sheer amount of administration that goes into these things. Um, and what kind of personality do you need going back to that? What kind of personality do you need? Because the guy that is the people will follow up a hill with bayonets in their teeth to go rip the guts out of the bad guys is not necessarily the guy you want sitting around the table talking about where which core is going to go where. Yeah. And that's a and so how do you grow that one leader and the other when, when you need both kinds of leaders? But the other leaders are the older guys, so you have to kind of go through that bayonet stage to get to the other folks, and that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, and the, the great the great line right there. So I'm sorry well, for going long. I know it's late in the evening. No, here. well, we'll leave it there. I mean, Phil Blood is saying that because he's writing his chapter about U.S. leadership right now in his Arkham book, and he's, he's learned a lot for, for his chapter. So that's that's high praise from Dr. Phil Blood over in in Germany who's also up late like I am. So, Bill, we'll, we'll bring you back for something else because this has been really, really good. It, it started off as just about uh, General Simpson, but it's turned into this whole how the hell does the army work, uh, which I tend to, you know, we we tend to avoid that a bit. We un I think most people understand how an infantry platoon works. They understand squads and sections in different armies. But this, the, the larger sized organization, I think is, an, is, a, is a mystery to most people because it is, you know, we're talking about... In the ETO of the winter 44, 45, mil literally millions of people, you know, and to manage all that without the benefit of computers and incredible, incredible. Yeah. All sorts of things. Well, Paul, thank you for having me. I, uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I was actually back in your neck of the woods uh, in, Bel in uh, Belgium uh, last month. So it was uh... cool. Of course, well, and I can't wait to receive the book. It's, it's it, you you sent your book, and it's in it's on its way to France via India, apparently, isn't it? So it's taking yeah. Well, I guess it wanted a curry. Uh, I, I don't know. So we'll see. And it'll arrive some. But anyway, Bill, it's been great talking to you, folks. Thank you very much for your fantastic questions and um, and comments. And we're back for just one show tomorrow. Hearts of, of Steel. We're talking about a Royal Navy uh, guy in his kind of first part of the show is tackling up up to his kind of interwar and up to the beginning of World War Two. But we'll do that tomorrow. So thanks, everybody. See you all again. This is Paul Willard for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day, if there's any left, depending on where you are. Bye.